Shalom. Ruchim Abayim. Welcome to Sheva Pani Le to the Seventy Faces of the Torah in Also Sulam Yaakov. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Bo. Bo in Hebrew means to come. And in a way, Hashem is actually telling Moshe Rabbeinu to come with him to confront Paro. In fact, it's brought down in the Zohar, in the words, in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, that Moshe was very hesitant to approach Paro. Not that he feared Paro as a man, but he feared the power behind Paro, which was the Satan, the adversary. And considering that Moshe grew up in the house of Paro, the house of Mitzrayim, he was very familiar with their spiritual beliefs and understood that these individuals drew power from a higher entity. And so Hashem is telling Moshe, Bo, come with me, and together we're going to confront Paro. Together we're going to take down the forts of Mitzrayim. You will confront Paro from the physical realm, while Hashem himself will confront the spiritual power behind Paro in the spiritual realm. I have subtitled this teaching, People of the Book. In this week's Torah portion, we read about the last two plagues of the ten plagues that Hashem afflicted upon Mitzrayim. That would be the plague of darkness, the plague of Choshech, and also the death of the Bechor, the death of the firstborn. Now, in the beginning of the Torah portion, Hashem informs Moshe that the primary function of the plagues is for the Jew Jewish people to retell the events of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, to their children. We read here Shemot, Exodus chapter 10, verse 1 through 2. There the Torah says, Vayom Adonai o Moshe, Hashem said to Moshe, Bo el paro, come to Pharaoh, ki ani hirbati et libo, for I have made his heart hard. And literally, you can also translate this to say, I have afflicted his heart, ve'et lev avadav, and also the heart of his servants, lama'an sheti ototai, in order that I may put these signs of mine, ele bichirbo, within his midst. And then it says also, there's a conjunctive of here, ulma'an, and furthermore, also, and also that you may relate it, tell it over in the ears of your sons and your son's son. In other words, your children and your grandchildren. That I made a mockery, okay, and also the etototai of Mitzrayim, and placed my signs, Asher Samti, okay, that I placed amongst them, that I placed literally there. Vam, okay, Samti Vam, right there, Vidatim Kiani Adonai, and therefore the verse ends by saying that you may know that I am Hashem. So here the Torah reveals that the retelling of Yitzhak Mitzrayim has really nothing to do with how powerful Hashem is, okay, in other words, God was not trying to demonstrate to Paro, to his servants, uh, to any unbelieving Jew about how powerful he was, that he was now going to get ready to obliterate the greatest metropolis on earth in those days, which was Mitzrayim. This is not what the Torah says the ten plagues are for. Rather, the Torah is teaching that the whole retelling of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, excuse me, is to tell one's children, as it says at the end of the verse, vidatem ki anilanai, to know that Hashem is Hashem. Okay, vidatim ki anilonai, that you may know that I am Hashem. It's about having an intimate knowledge of God. In the Yelenu prayer, we quote from the verse in Parshava Echanan that speaks about knowing Hashem. This is brought down in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39. It says, Ve'adata hayon, you shall know today, this day, vahashevota el and you shall return in your heart ki adonai hu ha'elokim. The Hashem, He is the God. And if you've heard me teach about this before, Elohim, the singular plural name of God, this doesn't mean God. It means power. Okay, power over all powers. That God is, Hashem is the power, Mimal, in the heavens above, and also in the earth below, that there is none. I have also explained in previous teachings that there is no mitzvah in the Torah to believe in God. We do not find a single mitzvah being uttered from the mouth of Hashem to Moshe. Moshe Lemor. Okay, God spoke to Moshe, speak to the children of Israel, and inform them to believe in me. We don't find a single verse, a single chapter that commands us to believe in Hashem. Rather, we do find verse after verse after verse the mitzvah to know Hashem. This is very important 
the mitzvah to know Hashem, just as we read here in Parsha Ve'echanan, Deuteronomy 4.39, Ve'adata hayom, that we should know, okay, there should be a knowing. And if we go back to the verse here for this week's Torah portion, at the very end of the verse when God says He's going to demonstrate His signs in the midst of the mitzlim, and also that it's going to have an impact upon the Jews in order to relate it over to their sons and grandsons, the whole purpose of this, the end of the verse says, is vidatem ki ani Adonai, that you should know that I am Hashem. This is the mitzvah that we have, is the knowledge of God, not just belief in God. And there is a difference. And so what we learn here is that the underlying purpose of retelling Yitzhak Mitzrayim over to one's children and grandchildren is to know Hashem. Now this is very interesting because when the Torah tells us that the plagues, that when God does the plagues, the last two plagues, to afflict the heart of Paro, to make it hard, and also the heart of his servants, but also Uma'an Tesaper, but it's also to have the impact or the impact and the influence to Tesaper, to be able to relate it over Be'oznei Vicha Uvenbienecha, to the ears of your sons and also your grandsons, okay? that the Torah focuses there on the word tisaper, which is very interesting because the word tisaper comes from the word sipor. And sipor means a story. Interesting. Sipor comes from the root word lisaper, which means to recount or to retell or to reiterate. Now what's interesting about this is that grammatically, the Hebrew word saper is related to the word sofer, okay? So saper, which deals with the root of retelling, reiterating, telling over a story, is related to the word sofer. And that's very, very interesting because the etymological root of these words teaches about the transmission of a story, whether it's in written form or oral form. Written form is what we would ascribe as a sofer, the oral form is saper, okay, that you tell over. And what is a sofer? A sofer is a person who writes what we call a sefer. A sefer is a document that differs from what we call an igeret, which is a letter or some people would translate as an epistle. For instance, most people, when they talk about a sefer, we tend to translate it as scroll, like a sefer Torah, sefer Torah, if it's more than one Torah, it's in the plural. Right? Usually a safer, also in modern vernacular, a safer could be a book, okay? Like a homish, things of that nature in book form with the printed valves and everything. But there is a difference between a safer and, let's say, an egeret. The difference between a safer and a egeret is that an egeret is written with lower standards than a safer. And according to halakha, a safer must be written on a certain parchment and it must be permanent. Okay, something like an Egeret, a letter, if you will, that can be discarded after it's read. All right, so it doesn't have the same uh, level of Kedusha, if you want to say, a holiness, or sanctification to it as a Sefer. And so also unlike an Egeret, a Sefer does not contain any superfluous words. While that may, what I'm saying there may appear to contradict itself, because if anyone's ever spent a little bit of time studying and probing the Torah, you may notice that the Torah tends to be superfluous. There's redundancy sometimes. However, you know, looks can be deceiving. As I explained in many of my teachings before, whenever the Torah uses superfluous expressions or words, it's there to try to teach a deeper meaning of the subject that it's introducing to it. So it's not being superfluous for the sake of being superfluous. A safer, excuse me, a sofer who writes a safer, a scribe who writes a book, for his generation, doesn't just write it for his generation, but also for future generations. And what's interesting about that is that over in Perky Avot, Chazal taught that there were 10 things that Hashem created on the Erev Shabbat, a creation. Amongst those 10 things is what we call Hakitav Vehamiktav, the ability to write. And as you can see here from Perky Avot 5.8, it says, Asara Devarim Nivre'u Be'erev Shabbat that there were 10 things created on the Erev Shabbat, which is the evening of cre creation. And it says, amongst the 10 things, is the script and the, uh, the inscription. V'ha-ketav v'ha miktav The ability to write, essentially, is what the sages are saying. Now, this is interesting when you think about it. 
because for Chazal to teach that the ability to write was among the ten things created on the Erish of creation suggests that there is something extraordinary in the ability to record an idea or event and to preserve it for thousands of years into the future. The written word allows us to delve into man's thoughts and identify with them. And so when we study the Torah, we're not merely learning about events that took place a thousand years ago. No. Through the skill of hakitav v'habmiktav, the ability to write, we become contemporaries of the personality recorded in the Torah. In other words, when you read about the story of Avraham in Parsha Lech Lecha, Parsha Vayera, Parsha Chayisera, what are you reading? You're not just reading about a narrative of somebody who lived over 4,000 years ago. When you read about the story of Avraham in the Torah, what impact does it have upon you? Many years ago, it's probably about 12, 13 years ago, I was attending a shiur and there was a guest rabbi in town that was speaking. And this rabbi, who has since passed on, Zeron Levracha, may his memory be a blessing, he explained that when he was a young child, he used to have to travel 16 miles to get to school. Yes, 16 miles, okay? And he explained that those 16 miles were filled with hills, they had wooded areas, and there was muddy pathways. And so as a child traveling 16 miles to get to school, he said he used to envision his travels to school as if it was a journey through a miniature wilderness. And what he used to think about when he would travel was he would used to imagine what it was like for Avraham to have traveled from the land of Haran into Eretz Israel. When Hashem told him, Lechacha, Lechacha, Mechartzecha, you need to go forth from your homeland. And he go through the journey. We read about these journeys of Abraham and the difficulties he had to go through, but how do we identify with them? So for this rabbi here as a child, he would try to envision what it was like for Abraham to go through his journey. So as he's going through difficult pathways or wooded areas, he would just kind of envision himself like Abraham. Instead of going to Eretz Israel, he was going to school. Now this is very interesting because sadly, we live in a world today where there is what is known as a generation gap. What is a generation gap, you might ask? Well, children today are disconnected to finding meaning in their parents' experiences. And this tragedy is not just related on the physical level with a, the biological relationship of mothers and fathers to their children, but it also extends to the lives of believers who read the Torah and they are greatly disconnected from finding meaning in the experience of their spiritual ancestors, such as Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. The ability to transport us in the past to span generations is the idea behind the rabbinical concept of hakitav v'hamikhtav, the ability to write. Through hakitav v'hamikhtav, we relive, relive events that happened thousands of years ago. And so the rabbinical concept of Hakitav Hamiktav comes to life during the Seder of Pesach. At the Seder table, we pick up the Haggadah. And in the Haggadah, we are told that in every generation, one is obligated to see himself as if he personally left Mitzrayim. Now, this is very interesting, but is it possible? I mean, how can one relive an event that happened over 3,500 years ago, right? If you think about this logically. In this week's Torah portion, the Torah says once again at the beginning of the parasha, that we must retell the event of Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim over to our sons and to our grandsons. This command is not about simply retelling a story that you pick up when you read to your kids when they're going to sleep. No. It's also not about performing a religious ritual to comply with the standards of Judaism like many people do at the Seder table when they open the Haggadah. The imperative of that you shall relate these things over to your sons and grandsons contains a deeper meaning. Anybody could tell a story to their son or grandson. It's very easy, once upon a time. And if you're, you know, you're, 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 you have a, quite an imaginative mind, you can make up your own story as you go along. But this is not what the Torah is commanding us. Once again, the word tesaper comes from the word sipor, which means story. And sipor comes from the root word lesaper, which means to recount. And once again, grammatically, saper is related to the word sofer. A sofer, a scribe, is one who transmits the sipor 
into a sefer, into what we call a book. When the Torah says, that you shall retell the Yitziyah, the Exodus from Mitzrayim, into the ears of your sons and grandsons, it means that the son and grandson should be the safer upon which the father writes. Now, obviously, not literally write upon the child. It's an allegory. Okay? In other words, the Chumash should have such an impact upon the life of the father or grandfather that in turn it will have a greater impact upon their son and their grandsons. This is very important because a lot of parents make the mistake in, in teaching children the ways of Hashem that if they open a Chumash, open a page of Mishnah or Gemara and simply just point to the words and kind of teach it academically, this is the proper way of Vishinatan Levanacha, teaching their children. But that's not, way, that's not the proper way. That's not what the Torah is telling us to do here. Children learn through our examples. They learn through emulating us. And so what we learn here is that the foremost task of a father is to be a sofer, is to be a scribe, to transform his son into a safer, upon which he writes indelibly a book that will survive him and be imparted to succeeding generations. After all, this is how the Jewish people have survived the ancient kingdoms of the nations for thousands of years. There's no ancient Mitzrim that are alive today. There's no ancient Babylonians. There are no ancient Persians, nor are there ancient Romans. But there is the ancient Jewish people who are still alive today. Jewish people are known by the appellation, the people of the book. Now, people of the book does not mean Jews are a group of people who are bookworms. There are plenty of Jews who love to read books. I enjoy books. I have a very large library. But that's not what the title, People of the Book, means. Rather, People of the Book means Jews are a group of people whose very being is a book. In this case, which book? The Torah. And that means each Jew is supposed to be a Torah Chai, a living Torah. And so the mitzvah of Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim, or retelling over the Exodus of Mitzrayim, means inscribing one's entire spiritual conscience upon the next generation until that next generation is ready to perform the same task of the Sipur at their Seder table with their own children. Now after the obligation of retelling of Yitziat Mitzrayim to one's sons and also one's grandsons, the Torah decides to issue the very first mitzvah that God gave the Jewish people while they were within Mitzrayim. That first mitzvah is Kiddush HaChodesh, the sanctification of the new month. We read here in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 through 2, it says, Vayomer Adonai on Moshe, Ve'el Aharon Be'eretz Mitzrayim, Le'mor Hashem spoke to Moshe and Aharon in the land of Mitzrayim, saying to them, HaChodesh Hazei Lachem, Rosh Chodeshim Rishon Hu Lachem, Lechadshe Hashana. This month shall be for you the head of the months. To you it shall be the first of the months of the year. Very interesting here. And I also have a separate study that deals with the mitzvah of Kiddush HaKodesh on this Torah portion. So when you get some time, take a look at that teaching uh, after this teaching. Now when you look at this mitzvah, you have to consider and think. Amongst all the mitzvot that Hashem could have gave the Jewish people in Mitzrayim, He chose to give them the mitzvah of Kiddush HaKodesh. Why? Kiddush HaChodesh is related to time. And according to Halakha, a slave is prohibited from what we call mitzvot ase shehazman grama, time-bound positive mitzvot. Why is a slave prohibited from fulfilling positive mitzvot, specifically that have to be performed at a certain time? Well, a slave lacks time experience. To a slave, time is a curse. A slave's time is the property of his master. No matter how hard the slave may try to be productive in time, he will never reap the harvest of his work. Life to the slave personality is motionless. When Hashem gave the mitzvah of Kiddush HaChodesh to the Jewish people, He gave it to them while they were still in the confines of Mitzrayim. The mitzvah of Kiddush HaChodesh came to teach the Jewish people the value of time and freedom. And so as a mitzvah rooted in time awareness, Kiddush HaChodesh contains three components. And unless one understands these three components, they will not be able to properly observe Kiddush HaChodesh. Yes, they may show up to the synagogue and may physically participate in the prayers of Kiddush HaChodesh. But unless they are spiritually and mentally in tune to the essence of Kiddush HaChodesh, any physical observance of the mitzvah is considered a puzzle. It's considered invalid. 
They're just having a religious experience. The first component to Kiddush HaChodesh is based upon retrospection. Without memory, there is no time. The second component to Kiddush HaChodesh requires the exploration or close examination of things yet unborn and the anticipatory experience of events not yet in existence. And the third component of Kiddush HaChodesh requires appreciation or evaluation of the present moment as one's most precious possession. So what does this mean? What do these three components represent? Well, no one is worthy of time awareness if retrospection is a foreign concept to them. If they are incapable of reliving, recovering, and reproducing past experiences. Memory is not just the storehouse of the brain for latent impressions. There must be a living memory which reproduces and re-experiences the past. Past events that are not re-experienced belong to the field of archaeology. They belong in a museum. Okay, where people go and visit and they become nostalgic about how the good old days were. For instance, the obligation of retelling the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim is not limited to the pages of the Torah. It's not about once upon a time, you know, long ago in the land of Egypt, the Jews live. We're not referring to Yitzhak Mitzrayim as if it's a, uh, a social studies class in high school or something. No, it's much deeper than that. Avraham Avinu was not just a figure who lived 4,000 years ago. He's not just a biblical character on the pages of the Bible. Avraham is actually a living personality. In fact, he is a part of my life. Just like in the story with the rabbi who mentioned he would travel 16 miles to go to school and his journey was filled with you know, hills and rocks and muddy pathways and woods, that he would actually envision what it was like for Avraham to journey from Haran to Eretz Israel. So he would utilize his time by trying to visualize himself as Avraham, integrating Avraham into his personality. Likewise, many of the great sages that we learn about are also a part of our personality. For instance, Rabbi Kiva, he's not simply a great rabbi who lived over 2,000 years ago, whose death is described as a Kiddush Hashem, he died a martyr's death. No, Rabbi's ability to suffer at the hands of the Romans when he outlawed the Torah to try to get the Jews to recognize the veneration of Roman emperors, okay, was defied by rabbis like Rabbi Akiva because they would still commit and submit themselves to Hashem's Torah. And therefore, Rabbi Akiva's ability to suffer at the hands of the Romans is also a part of my life. In other words, his image and teachings are integrated into my personality because it also teaches me how to defy my inner Edom, my inner Rome, okay, to die to the nature of my carnality. When I read about the Ramchal or the Rambam, I don't simply read about a group of great rabbis who lived in the past. No, their images have become part and parcel of me, of my eye awareness. And it's the same thing with the other great men and women that we read about in the Torah and Tanakh. To live in time and feel its rhythm, one must move from the memory of the past to the unreality of the future. One must go from things and events that were and are no longer towards that which will be real one day, even though it's not yet real. Why? Because when you and I carry out certain actions in this world, when we do certain things in conjunction with the mitzvot, we are attempting to concretize the manifestation of that very thing that's immaterial to material. And if you study with me for any moment of time, you know that I explain this in great detail when I talk about swinging the lulav, the mitzvah, the arba menin, the four species that we utilize during Sukkot, that we are required to take these four species and wave them in six directions from heaven to earth and north, south, east, and west. And we accompany them by saying blessings and also giving thanks to Hashem. Excuse me. Give thanks to Hashem. Why? For His kindness is forever. So we are asking God for blessing to materialize from on high, down below and that it will come from the four corners. And so it's not here, but yet we give thanks to Hashem as if it's here. We try to visualize it if it's here and now. And that's the same reality that Avraham had to live with when Hashem told him to get up and walk the expanse of the land, the land that Hashem was going to give him and his descendants, even though he didn't have physical acquisition of the property yet or enough descendants' children yet. But yet Avraham got up, 
he vis physically walked the land, he mentally visualized the land, and he said his affirmations to Hashem. He thanked Hashem. He did everything based upon the moon of Bitachon. And therefore, even though it was not tangible, he lived it out as if it was tangible. And the same thing must be for us. We must go from reminiscing to anticipating. It's not enough just to be nostalgic about, oh, this day or back then in the past. No. We have to go to anticipating. There has to be a sense of zerizut, of alacrity within us, of earnest expectation. And to, so to live in time means to be committed to great events of the past and look forward to an unborn future. This is why when we are at the Seder table, as I taught in my teachings for Pesach, that the first half of the Seder is normally dedicated to reliving the past of Mitzrayim, coming out, that former generation. But the second half of the Seder is about creating the reality of the great redemption, which is why we preserve a cup for Eliyahu. We get up and we go look for Eliyahu at the door, and there's a the custom in some Haredi communities where the guests or the host of the home will slowly walk as if they have someone invisibly with their hand around their shoulders having a conversation with them, putting them up to the table, tucking the chair in, like, what's going on here? They believe that they are walking with the spirit of Eliyahu. Now, it's not literally Eliyahu, but they believe that the actions that they are doing, the concretization uh, of the energy or the kavanah that they're doing is going to concretize the manifestation of Eliyahu. In other words, the energy that they are putting into that mitzvah at the Seder table is going to create the reality that one day there will be a physical Eliyahu at the door telling everyone the Gula is here. And so this type of kavanah must be accompanied with every mitzvah. Because we can look at the great events in the past, the Yitziyah, the exodus from Mitzrayim. And while the Jews were not worthy of their own merit to be redeemed from Mitzrayim, it came from the great Chem V'chesed, the great kindness of Hashem. Nonetheless, we can look at those events and say, hey, we long, we look forward to a great redemption in the future where if we take a look at the merit of many people in today's reality, it seems like we're pretty much similar to what was happening thousands of years ago, but that also should spark within us an anticipation of a greater redemption from exile. And that means everything we do should be done with a proper kavanah. Time awareness also contains the moral element of responsibility. Responsibility for emerging events and intervention in a historical process. What do I mean? Well, man in Jewish thought is required to shape and fashion the future. This is why Hashem created each and every one of us with what we call Bechira, with free will. We are free to reach a certain decision that will determine our future and the world's future. Everything we do can have a positive or negative impact. To sit around on our blessed tuchus and think we're going to wait for Hashem to fix our problems is actually lazy. And it's not respectable in the eyes of Hashem. As I explained in my teachings before, when Hashem instituted the covenant with Avraham and Lech Lecha, He told Avraham to walk before Him and be blameless. Compared to Noah, the Torah describes Noah walking with Hashem. When it comes to Hanoch, Enoch, they, He walked with Hashem. But Avraham was given the command to walk before Hashem. In other words, to be a Jew means that you cannot always hold on to the hand of God. You must do the moral and righteous thing according to the Torah and be a trendsetter and Hashem will always have your back. And therefore when we do this, we are using our free will to create a reality of holiness, of redemption. However, at the same time, we can forfeit our free will by going off the derech and creating a reality of darkness and chaos, chasas chalila, God forbid. So to connect retrospection with anticipation, memory with uh, anticipation, and memory with expectation, hindsight with foresight, we must cherish the present as if it represents eternity. And this is something I also see problematic in the psychology of a lot of people that have a fictitious understanding of the afterlife, of heaven, if you will. And I don't mean to rain on anyone's parade or to be condescending or anything, but it is a psychological flaw. Most people think that when a pastor in this world or when God intervenes and He's going to fix the world's problems, that this better tomorrow comes and everyone's going to be happy and living luxurious life and there's no pain and problems and, and yada, yada, yada. Well, the problem with that type of thinking is that if you don't know how to actually take the time out in your trial and tribulation in the discomforts of life that you're going through now 
to try to find joy and content and be grateful to Hashem, then what makes you think you're going to have that ability when you transition from this world to the next world? People have a very vague understanding about eternal life, about the immortality of the soul. Because in Jewish thought, you create your Olom Haba. The energy that you actually invoke in this life is going to determine what you carry with you when you leave this world. Now, obviously, for those who come from a Christian background, they're taught that, well, if you just believe in Yeshua, then, you know, that's your salvation. Now, from a non-Jewish perspective, having belief, okay, in the merit of a Sadiq, and having access to God when the non-Jews will have a covenant with God unless they become Jewish, okay, can be debatable, okay, for theological purposes. But from a Jewish perspective, Jews are required, okay, to live up to the Torah mitzvot. They have to be accountable for their part of the deal of the covenant. And therefore, the eternal olam haba that they create all depends on what they do in this reality. Therefore, how we cherish the present, whether it's good or bad, is going to be somewhat ind indicative of the outcome of our eternality, or of, our, of, our, of our eternal life, if you will, of our eternity. And that means that if we learn to have joy, happiness, and everything, even when things are not right in this world, that means also we can have authentic joy when we transition from one world to the next. The point is, is that if we simply think, oh, the future is going to be better, it's going to be this, it's going to be that, Normally, that's not how things turn out to be. Nothing ever turns out the way we think it is. And that's the deceptive part of the Yitzhahara in our mind. We have to learn to cherish the present as if it represents eternity. That means if we're depressed, we're not happy, we're angry, then what do you think your Olam Haba is going to be like? God forbid. That's not the type of Olam Haba anyone should have. In Judaism, when it comes to time, the present is always giving great emphasis. Always the present. Because every minute is valuable, every second is precious. With a fraction of a second, one may realize or destroy hopes, vision, and expectations. This is why, in Jewish thought, everything is governed by halakha, by Jewish law. The halakha is time conscious. For example, one who gets up in the morning and decides to recite the Shema prayer at about 10.05 a.m. instead of 9.05 a.m., well, that person has missed the window of time to have their prayer have an impact upon the fabric of creation. And this is why I explained in many of my teachings before, when it comes to prayer, specifically when we read the Ve'ahavta prayer in Deuteronomy, it says there in the Torah, it says it two times over, in the first part of Ve'ahavta and the second part, U shabechecha u chumecha. When you arise, okay, when you retire and when you arise. In other words, when you go to sleep and when you get up, you shall acknowledge the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, what constitutes when a person goes to bed, what constitutes when they get up? And so you go explore Masech Brachot, which deals with the whole breakdown of what constitutes sunrise, sunset, two stars, three stars, sun upon a horizon. You learn everything. A very fascinating Masech and learning about what governs time. But essentially what we learn from this is that prayer is a time-bound mitzvah. And if one is late to fulfill their heavenly duty, it can yield negative results in their life, just like arriving late to work can have negative results, or going to court can have negative results, God forbid. And so therefore, we have to be governed by the time-bound of the Torah, right? governed by time-bound mitzvot, I should say. In that sense where our mind always recognizes, okay, there's no uh, negotiating here. This is my window of time of prayer. Let me hurry up and get it done. Not with the attitude, get it out the way, but let me hurry up and engage in this mitzvah. Same thing when it comes to mincha or any of the other times, when it comes to the service of Shabbat, etc. All these are time-bound mitzvot. In Jewish thought, time is of critical importance. Not years or months, but seconds and even split seconds. And so this time awareness and appreciation is the singular gift granted to each and every one of us. And because time belongs to us, it is our time. And that means we can utilize it to the utmost or a chasis chalila, God forbid, we can waste it. And so in conclusion to today's teaching, what we learn is that the Jewish people are the people of the book. That means that they are also the people of time. And that means that the Jew who lives in the technological advancement of New York City today is the same Jew that lived in the ancient time of Yerushalayim thousands of years ago. 
time might have changed, but the essence of the Jew remains the same when it comes to their commitment to the internality of God's Torah, which is timeless. And so one of the things that the Torah comes to teach us in this parasha is that the people of the book are the people of time. And therefore, that mitzvah that's incumbent upon every father to relate the Yitziyat Mitzrayim into the ears of their sons and their grandsons is that this is a sipor that's going to transmit through time and space that the Jew who first told about the sipor mitz, uh, Yitziyat Mitzrayim, okay, is like the same Jew who lives today. The narrative is the same. The Torah is the same. The essence is the same. And so we have to learn to be within the confines of what the Torah teaches of that aspect. And this is why I also mentioned I have another teaching for Parashat Bo, which if I'm not mistaken, the subtitle is called Time is of the Essence, which is a, you know, basically a uh, uh, idiom that many of us are familiar with, Time is of the Essence. And from that perspective, I deal with the whole concept of Kiddush HaChodesh, the lunar calendar, and the or the applicability of what that means to each and every one of us. So with that said, Chavarim, I hope that this teaching has imparted some inspiration to you and challenged you to better understand um, your relationship with Hashem and His Torah and understanding the concept of what it means to be people of the book, essentially also people of time, and what that means in relation to fulfilling our roles as, uh, as, uh, as the children of Hashem, servants of Hashem. And so with that said, once again, if our organization is a blessing to you, prayerfully consider to support us financially. You can find the links on our website to donate. If you want to send a check or money order, you can find the address on the website, or you can choose to donate via PayPal. Other than that, we greatly appreciate your support, also your prayers. And if you guys ever have any questions pertaining to some of the topics of the Torah portion, please feel free to send me an email at rabbi70faces or rabbi 70 faces. Uh, Torah.com. I will get to those in the order that they come in. Until next time, Chavarim, may the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov bless you and your families. Shalom and Kol Tov.